Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. How are you? We're so excited to have Paolo G. Gregorio back. He's got a cult following. The room's packed. He's here straight from Florence. Sort of. <laughs> sort of, kind of. Um, to talk about the Medici dynasty. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you. So how's everybody doing today? Great. Um, so here we are, Eastern Massachusetts, and tomorrow is a really big day around here, right? What's the day tomorrow? St. Patrick's Day. So today we're going to talk about Italy. Um, <laughs> uh, we are going to talk today about the Medici dynasty. Now, those of you who have been to Italy, those of you who have studied uh, art history or history at all, probably have heard the name Medici. The Medici were a prominent family in the um, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries in Italy and in Europe. They begin in the city of Florence uh, to gain prominence, to gain wealth. They become hugely influential in terms of Western culture. The uh, Medici are often called the godfathers of the Renaissance, and we'll get into that in a couple of minutes. And they also end up getting involved in many of the other royal families across Europe. So it's a dynasty that has um, long reach, even though their base of power is the city of Florence, is the region of Tuscany. The Medici are involved in all sorts of European and really global politics during, during their period. Uh, the story that we are going to tell today is a story of, well, passion, power, uh, of intrigue. There is assassination and murder and uh, scandal and all sorts of good stuff. The, the story of the Medici would make a great uh, miniseries. In fact, I think there was a miniseries that was done by, about the Medici. So it's very soap opera-y at times. Uh, there's a lot of politics at play. There is, of course, the creation of fabulous works of art. So we're going to dive into the story of the Medici and talk about what they did, how they, how they interacted, and, and their long-lasting legacy. So where do we begin with the Medici? Well, as I said, the story unfolds here in the city of Florence. Florence... Uh, at its peak in the uh, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries was one of the great cultural centers of Western Europe. Uh, Florence itself was a city that was very proud of being Florence. The Florentines had established a republic, a republican form of government. That meant that they were not ruled by kings or princes. They had a sort of elected government. There was popular voice in picking the leadership of the city, and they were hugely independent. They were not part of any other great empire. They were not part, they were not dominated by the papal states or by the French or the Austrians or the Spanish or whoever happened to be uh, marching through the Italian peninsula at that time. So Florence was hugely proud of its independence, of its prosperity. Uh, the city of Florence itself is located along the banks of the Arno River. And it's that river and the location of Florence right in the middle of the Italian peninsula that gave rise to its prosperity. The city of Florence has its wealth based in, at first, the wool industry, the wool trade. Um, lots of sheep in the hills of Tuscany. Florence becomes the, the wool market of that region. Once uh, that wool market is established, and once that prosperity in the trade of wool and cloth emerges, Florence also starts to become a center of banking and finance. So what we see in the 14th century, the 1300s, is that Florence is a prosperous city. It is a city that is tremendously proud of its independence. It is a city that is uh, wealthy because of textiles. It's wealthy because of its banking system. And it is a city that is... Um, stridently independent. It does not want to be part of any other state. It likes to be on its own. Now, the center, the, the urban center, the public center of uh, the political activity of Florence, really the symbol of Florence's independence, is this square over here called Piazza della Signoria. It's still one of the great public squares in the city of Florence today. Uh, this was essentially the arena in which Florentine politics played out. This is where the crowds gathered to make their voices heard. The building right here today called Palazzo Vecchio is also known as Palazzo, Palazzo della Signoria. The Signoria was the governing body of the city of Florence. It was essentially the city council. And it was that Signoria that, that ruled over the city of Florence. The members of that entity of the Signoria were chosen by the people. Now, 
it wasn't a pure democracy in Florence. The wealthy families had a monopoly on positions in the Signoria. The wealthy individuals, members of those families or their allies often won election to those positions, to those seats. Uh, there's probably bribery and uh, greasing the palm involved to get your candidate elected. But by and large, what we see in Florence during this time period is the practice of republicanism, the people having a voice, the people electing their officials who governed over the city. And this was the arena where all of that played out. Now, because this was the center of Florentine politics, it also becomes hugely symbolically important as the seat of power, really the heart of Florentine wealth and prosperity. So it, over time, becomes a very ceremonial space where there are lots of statues and ornaments and fancy structures that are, that are put here. This was the place where uh, public trials were held, either inside the building or out here in the square, and public executions were held, and festivals occurred in this, in this square. So this really was the beating heart of Republican Florence. This was the center of the city. And a lot of the drama that we, we tell or will encounter with the Medici does play out here in this, this center. Now, there is another important uh, aspect of Florentine society during this period of prosperity. If you have the civic government, you also had the religious aspect of the city. And a short walk from Piazza, Piazza della Signoria, in fact, from where we're standing, it would be behind me if we go this way, we end up in Piazza Duomo, which is where the Grand Cathedral of Florence is, one of the more famous buildings in the city, this giant red dome. Uh, one of the, the great structures of um, the Italian Renaissance. That church was also a, a symbol of Florentine pride. Because Florence was so wealthy and they were so successful and they were independent, they wanted to build a church that represented their grandeur, that represented their sense of self. So in the 12th century, they started building this massive church, which at the time was the largest church in Europe. Today, it's, I think, the third largest church in Europe. So it is a, a giant structure. So over the centuries, this church is being constructed. And by the time we get to the late 14th, early 15th century, the structure is mostly done, except for one big problem, the dome. Nobody knows how to finish the structure off. Uh, there were all sorts of different plans for how to, to complete the structure of the church, Santa Maria de Fiori, the, the Duomo of Florence. So we have this, this moment where Florentine pride maybe got a little bit too big for itself. The city couldn't figure out how to cap the massive church that they had built. Now, the Medici do come into play when we get there. So um, this is kind of setting the stage for what happens when the Medici do emerge in the city of Florence. Now, where do the Medici come from? They're not actually from Florence itself. They're from one of the small country towns outside of Florence in the, the Tuscan countryside. But they do make their way into the city of Florence. And by the late 14th century, the Medici have established themselves and begin to, to grow and prosper within the city itself. Now, if we take a look at the uh, family tree of the Medici dynasty, where the story of Medici power and prosperity begins is actually up here at the top with a man named Giovanni de Bici de Medici. Um, when talking about the Medici, the, the uh, use of names, you have the person's first name, then you have their father's name, so it's Giovanni de Bici being the father, de Medici being the family name. So when we get into it, you'll see a lot of these long names referring to the people that came before them. But Giovanni de Bici de Medici is a significant figure in the rise of the dynasty because he does something that is hugely important. He establishes... Medici prosperity in the city of Florence itself, itself. And he does that by founding a bank, the Medici Bank. That Medici Bank will be the root of the grandeur of the Medici, will be one of the driving engines of the early part of the Renaissance. And I'll talk about the bank in a minute. What we then see with Giovanni de Bici here is that he has two sons, Cosimo, the elder son, and Lorenzo, the younger son. Now this is important because these two branches of the Medici family will be uh, the members that fill out the story that we're, that we're weaving today. You have the senior branch here and then the junior branch over there and uh, power and rule jumps from this, this branch to that branch later on in the story. But this is the family tree of the Medici dynasty. This is the family that will have such influence in Florence, in Italy, in Europe, over its uh, 
couple of centuries of power. So, as I said, it is Giovanni de Bici, this man over here, who establishes the Medici Bank in the late 14th century. Um, now, this is an important time and a, an important moment in the story because the 14th century throughout Europe was, frankly, disastrous. What happens in the 14th century? Well, the century starts off with a famine that kills about 10% of the European population. Then you have the Black Death in the middle of the century, which wipes out about a third to 50% of the European population. Then you have endemic warfare. The Hundred Years' War between England and France is wage, uh, raging throughout this entire period. There's a lot of political and social instability across Europe during that 14th century. And that was um, frankly not good for many banks, for many businesses. And a lot of banks that had been established prior to um, 1346, let's say, had begun to collapse, had begun to fall apart by the end of the century. So a lot of banks that had been the basis of Florentine prosperity were failing. It's kind of uh, ironic that we talk about failing banks today, right? Um, in any case, what we see is that banks in Florence that were run by noble established Florentine families were collapsing. Now, part of the reason why those banks were collapsing was because, uh, frankly, they made bad loans. They made loans to princes and popes and kings. And what happens if a prince or a pope or a king decides not to pay back that loan? You lose the money. So a lot of those banks had made poor business decisions, had lost a lot of money because of the economic collapse brought about by the Black Death and warfare and other things in the 14th century. A lot of those banks were failing. Well, it is here at the end of the 14th century that Giovanni de Bici says, I'm going to establish a bank, but I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to be very conservative in my management of money. I am going to make sure that when I make loans, those loans will be paid back. I'll get some sort of collateral or something like that. I'll keep good track of the money that's coming in and going out of the bank. And what we see under uh, Giovanni de Bici de Medici is that the bank flourishes. It becomes prosperous. And in fact, by the first half of the 15th century, the Medici Bank will be the most important financial institution in Europe. At its peak, it will have branches in Rome, uh, obviously in Florence, in Milan, in Amsterdam, in London, in Paris. I think there was one in Lyon. It has a network of banks across Western Europe. It is uh, a, a, a important engine in the economic revival of Western Europe in the aftermath of the Black Death and all of that chaos. Uh, there's a branch in Avignon and in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, among the notable innovations that the Medici introduced to their banking were things like double entry bookkeeping. I don't know if any of you have ever taken any um, financial management classes, but double entry bookkeeping, you're keeping a track of your, your profits and your losses at the same time. So you can actually see how much you actually have, how much money you actually have available. They introduced things like letters of credit, essentially a 14th century credit card um, saying, you know, this person has this much money in deposit in our bank here in Florence. That person goes to London. They have access to that much money in the Medici Bank in London. And they, had, uh, they were innovators in establishing holding companies and franchises, basically selling licenses for people to set up, um, kind of like a McDonald's, but a Medici bank in different cities. So all of these innovations and the conservative nature in which they gave out their loans led to tremendous prosperity for the Medici family and for the city of Florence. In fact, one of the uh, main forms of currency that circulates throughout Western Europe was the coin of Florence, uh, the one you see over there on the right, which was called a Florins. The gold Florins becomes one of the main circulating coins throughout Western Europe because of the stability of the Medici Bank, because of the success of the Medici Bank. So Giovanni de Bici de Medici was really a, uh, I guess we could say, a late 14th century financial wizard. He establishes this bank and sets it on a sound footing. Now, he's not involved in politics. His main, his main focus is the prosperity of the bank. And when he dies, he is succeeded as the head of the Medici family and the head of the Medici bank by his son, Cosimo. Cosimo de Medici. It's Cosimo who really begins to insert the Medici family into politics in Florence and in Tuscany. Uh, there we see a, a nice contemporary portrait of Cosimo. He gets the nickname 
Pater Patria, which means father of his country, a nickname given to him by his contemporaries, by other Florentines and people from Tuscany. And uh, what we see with Cosimo is that he, like his father, was very much concerned about the success of the Medici Bank. He was watching the books. He was keeping track of the money. He was increasing the size of the bank itself, amassing a huge, huge fortune. But Cosimo also realized that because he was now the wealthiest person in Florence, he could have tremendous influence in Florentine politics. Now, one of the things about Cosimo is that he was never really in the forefront of politics. He never stood for office, never wanted to be elected to any office. But he made sure that his friends and his supporters were winning those elections and were filling out the body of the Signoria. He was using his wealth judiciously to uh, grease some palms, to win some votes, to establish uh, de facto Medici control over the government of Republican Florence. In addition to that, because of his growing status, because of his wealth and his political influence, although he was, again, pulling the strings behind the scenes, he does emerge as one of the leading figures in the city of Florence. He is involved, in fact, in the, um, the, the committee that has to decide how do we finish the Duomo? What are we going to do to cap the church? Um, how are we going to put, what is going to be a fitting uh, crown for this massive church we have built in the middle of our city? And uh, it is the influence of Cosimo de' Medici that probably leads to Brunelleschi being chosen to build that massive dome, the iconic dome that we see today. Uh, the fact that Cosimo was involved in that decision shows the growing status that he had among the people of Florence itself. So Cosimo sees the bank reaching unprecedented heights. He sees Medici power growing in Florence, Medici influence growing in Florence, though again, behind the scenes. And he decides, you know what? We're now the leading family in the city. We need to have a fitting house. We need to have a, a palazzo close by to all the businesses, all of our banks, the church, the Piazza della Signoria. So he commissions the uh, architect, Michelozzo, to build the Palazzo Medici. That's his house, That's his house uh, which was begun around 1430. Um, now, the house, the Palazzo that we see here, is very similar to other contemporary Florentine Palazzi. The wealthy families in Florence had houses that looked like this. They're all over the downtown area, the historic area of the city. And the architectural style of the house was meant to evoke kind of um, Republican simplicity. Here you have the wealthiest man in Florence, the most powerful man in Florence, but he doesn't want to show off that wealth. He doesn't want to show off that prosperity and that privilege. He builds a house that fits in, that blends in with the rest of the city. You can see it has these three tiers, the three levels. On the ground level, you have those rusticated stones to make it look like a, a medieval house, a country villa. But then as you get higher and higher up, the details become a little bit more refined, a little bit fancier. Yet from the outside, it is relatively humble as humble as a palazzo could be, I guess. Now, this was the public face of the Medici family. This is what people saw in the streets of Florence. It matched Cosimo's personality. He was a Republican on the outside. He had wealth, he had privilege, but he didn't dress flashy. He didn't really show off that wealth and privilege, at least openly. Like Cosimo, however, if you were to go into the house, if you were to go into the palazzo, you would be overwhelmed with opulence. The finest artists and architects of the day were brought in to decorate the interior of the Palazzo Medici. Here you see one of the frescoes in the family chapel in the Palazzo. Uh, this is a famous uh, painting that depicts Renaissance princes, all the powerful members of uh, the Medici family in Florentine society. Lots of portraits here dressed in their fort, uh, 15th century finest. Uh, set into a kind of fi fantastical Florentine landscape. You see the architectural detail in the the refinement of the interior in the courtyard of the Palazzo Medici. And uh, uh, Cosimo hires some of the newest artists, the new up and coming artists to create works of art to be placed inside the courtyard for the family's amusement. One of the artists that is hired and commissioned by Cosimo was a young sculptor by the name of Donatello. Donatello creates this bronze statue for the Medici family, for Cosimo. Um, the statue of David dates from around 1430 or so. 
this statue is uh, hugely significant in the story of art history because it is sometimes considered the first real example of Renaissance art. It is the first attempt by an artist to create um, almost a realism in the sculpture. Prior to this, in the 14th century, sculpture tended to be very stiff. It tended to be very formulaic. You had statues with both feet planted on the ground in their arms in kind of unnatural poses, almost robotic poses. Here, what do we see? We see kind of liveliness. We see curves of the body. We see a young David holding the sword, his foot resting on the head of the giant Goliath in a natural pose, kind of a relaxed pose, hand on hip, uh, legs slightly bent. This was revolutionary. This was new. And this was an exciting form of sculpture, a new way of looking at the world, a new way of looking at society. So what we see under Cosimo is that the Medici, start to emerge into Florentine society, into Florentine politics. They start to hire the great artists, the newest artists, producing artwork in the newest, most contemporary style. Well, what happens? Cosimo um, eventually dies, and he is succeeded by his son, who was called Piero. Uh, Piero is known as Piero the Gouty because he suffered from gout. Um, and in fact, it was so severe that he couldn't walk through the streets of Florence. He had to be carried through the streets of Florence on a litter. Uh, Piero is the head of the family for only a couple of years. He dies and is succeeded by his son, his eldest son, whose name was Lorenzo. Uh, Lorenzo becomes the head of the Medici family, the head of the Medici bank, when he's about 19 years old. Um, and he will be really one of the more significant figures, one of the more celebrated figures of the Medici dynasty, and one of the important patrons of the Renaissance. Um, as a young man, Lorenzo lived in that Palazzo Medici. He saw artists working, creating works of art, sculptors and painters, decorating and creating all this art for his father, for his grandfather. And he kind of embraced that idea. He realized that art could be a powerful tool could cement his power. And what we see under Lorenzo is that he kind of abandons that, uh, that, that facade of not being interested in politics. He openly becomes the leader of Florence, the political head of Florence. His grandfather was pulling the strings behind the scenes, using his wealth uh, to control and to have people elected. Lorenzo kind of abandons that, and he becomes the, the guy in charge. While Florence is still technically a republic, it was very clearly a republic that was in the hands of Lorenzo de' Medici, who comes to be known as Lorenzo the Magnificent. He actually gets that nickname during his lifetime. Uh, now, why does he get that nickname? Because Lorenzo lived a magnificent life. Uh, he spent lots of money to make Florence a showplace. He hired artists. He hired architects. He, he pushed the... Uh, construction of public art throughout the city. He hosted festivals throughout the city where he paid for all the food and the drink. Why was he doing that? Well, how do you keep the people happy? How do you keep the common people of Florence, the, the poor people of Florence, happy and loyal to you? You keep them fed, you keep them entertained, you make the city a showplace, uh, building beautiful statues and artwork all over the place. So Lorenzo freely spent the money that was at his disposal. I just unplugged my computer. Uh, <laughs> freely spent the money that was at his disposal to, um, to cement his power, to elevate his status in the public eye. Now, there was a problem with that, of course. He was spending the money faster than the bank was making the money. And in fact, Lorenzo cared very little about managing the books of the bank. His father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather had been very careful about money. Lorenzo was spending money hand over fist to make sit Florence a beautiful city to cement his political position. Now, in doing so, in uh, providing bread and circuses, if you will, for the people of Florence and, and openly displaying his power and his wealth, Lorenzo does make a lot of enemies, particularly among the old established Florentine families. Many of those old noble families looked at the Medici and still saw them as outsiders as 
uh, new money, if you will, because they weren't originally from Florence. They were from the countryside. What you have with the Medici are country bumpkins who have made money and move into the city. Think uh, Beverly Hillbillies, if you want. Um, that was how some people viewed the Medici family, that why are they here? Why should they have so much influence? They're not as noble as we are. They're not as established as we are. So there was a lot of resentment towards the Medici. There was a lot of resentment toward Lorenzo himself. And that would lead to a moment of crisis during Lorenzo's um, his rule over the city of Florence. Because what we see is that at one point, a conspiracy is hatched by some of those prominent members of the other noble families, a conspiracy to dispatch the Medici family. Now, Lorenzo has a younger brother whose name is Giuliano. And Giuliano uh, is kind of a playboy. He likes to go out and have a good time. He realizes Lorenzo's the one in charge. So Giuliano has no cares in the world. He is out drinking and carousing and chasing women all over the place. Um, I'm sure his wife wasn't real happy about it, but you know. Um, so he is out living the life, enjoying his time in Florence. Um, and, you know, Lorenzo is the one keeping everything in order, keeping the family in a position of power, keeping the machine moving. So you have these two brothers who are essentially the heads of the the Medici family, although it's really Lorenzo who, who uh, runs everything. And they become the targets of the enemies of the Medici family. There is one great conspiracy uh, that does cause turmoil for the Medici. It's called the Pazzi conspiracy. The Pazzi were one of those old noble Florentine families that resented the Medici, that uh, wanted to get rid of the Medici to humble them, if you will. And what we see is that the Pazzi and other conspirators, including the Archbishop of Pisa, Pisa was a rival city of Florence for a long time, just down at the other end of the Arno River, um, with the knowledge of the Pope in Rome, they hatched this conspiracy to get rid of Lorenzo and Giuliano. The conspiracy um, basically was the assassination attempt, I should say, was to take place during the Easter Sunday Mass in the Cathedral of Florence. The, um, the moment when things were supposed to happen was the high point of the Mass when the priest at the altar was holding aloft the host, uh, kind of the, the most important part of any Mass. And it was at that moment that the assassins were supposed to strike. Now, that day arrives, the day, the time of the Mass. Lorenzo is there very early. He's sitting right up front in front of the altar as his, his normal position. Giuliano is nowhere to be found. Uh, he is not around. Of course, why is he not around? What had he been doing the night before and probably into the wee hours of the morning? Carousing and drinking with his buddies. So uh, the Mass is started and Lorenzo's up front. Eventually, Giuliano and his friends do show up and they're at the back of the church near the main entrance. And the Mass is going on and things are going fine. And at that moment, the high point of the Mass, the host is held aloft, the assassins strike. The men surrounding Giuliano, some of the men that he had been out partying with the night before, were members of this conspiracy. And they pull out their swords and their knives and they stab him to death there in the church at the door of Florence Cathedral. At the other end of the church, um, where Lorenzo was standing, the assassins tried to get to him, but there's the commotion at the back of the church and everybody turns to look. And in turning to look, Lorenzo manages to avoid the uh, main thrust of the dagger being sent at him. He is wounded, but not killed. His friends cover him and drag him away from the, the church. They hide him in a sacristy for a short while. There is chaos that breaks out in the church. There is chaos that breaks out in the city of Florence. Um, Lo uh, Giuliano is obviously dead. Nobody knows what happened to Lorenzo. His friends hide him. They take him and they, they uh, bring him back to the Palazzo Medici, which is only about two blocks away. And he is uh, being taken care of there in the Palazzo Medici. In the meantime, the conspirators march down to the Piazza della Signoria and uh, shout up to the Signoria that is gathered in the palace that they are now taking control of the city. They are now going to be the ones in charge. The Medici are dead. This, of course, sends shockwaves out into the city. The people are kind of stunned. The Medici are dead. What happened? Where's, where's Lorenzo? So there's this moment of chaos. There's this moment of, of um, uncertainty in Florence in um, 1478 after, as this event takes place. Well, 
in the midst of this uncertainty, in the midst of this disbelief among the people, Lorenzo emerges from hiding. He emerges from his palazzo. He's alive. He is well. The crowd rallies to Lorenzo. After all, he's beloved by them because he's feeding them and drink, giving them drinks and turning Florence into this beautiful city. And they storm down to the Piazza della Signoria, where they grab many of the conspirators and begin to beat them up. The Archbishop of Pisa, who was a nephew of the Pope, I believe, is actually dragged into the, Piazza, into the uh, Palazzo della Signoria and um, hanged from the neck from one of the upper windows uh, in, his full pa in his full bishop's vestment. So he's dressed there in his church clothes. He is thrown out of the window, hanging, dangling from the window. He is left there to dangle as a warning to others. So this Pazzi conspiracy, which was meant to topple the Medici, fails to achieve that goal. And in fact, it strengthens Lorenzo's position because now he knows who his enemies are. They've acted out in the open. He knows he has the support of the people. The, the mob basically goes to round up those who conspired against Lorenzo. Some of the higher ranking members of the conspiracy do manage to run off into the countryside. They'll eventually be hunted down. Uh, and you have this probably the most grave, most serious threat to Lorenzo's power, to the Medici power in Florence at this time that is overcome. The failure of the Pazzi conspiracy does cement Lorenzo's influence. It does increase his prestige among the people. He becomes very clearly the ruling power in Florence at this time. And um, as he had done before, he continues to spend lavishly. Now, Lorenzo does run into problems here because despite the fact that the conspiracy has been, been weeded out, has been crushed, um, Lorenzo's supporters did just kill the Archbishop of Pisa, who was a nephew of the Pope. So the Pope um, basically threatens to put the entire city of Florence under an interdict, uh, basically prevent them from participating in the church. The churchmen in Florence rebel against the Pope. So you have this standoff that's taking place, a uh, religious standoff over what happened to the, uh, the Bishop of Pisa. Now, um, the... the Pope is supported by the king of southern Italy, the king of Naples. He has that support. So Lorenzo and Florence are in a very dangerous position. What does Lorenzo do? He sneaks out of Florence to go to Naples, the, the capital of that southern Italian kingdom, to meet with the king of Naples, the king of the, of the two Sicilies eventually, um, to kind of sway his mind. Uh, and Lorenzo goes by himself. He's unaccompanied. He sets off into enemy territory. And his bravery, his audacity wins the day. He actually convinces the king in Naples to abandon the pope, to side with the Florentines, which means that the pope is essentially left without allies, and he eventually has to, to uh, give in. And Lorenzo and the Medici and Florence emerge from this political situation. So Lorenzo, in his bravery and his audacity, does secure his position as the ruler of Florence, as the most important person of Florence. And to celebrate that, what does he do? He continues to spend money, spending money left and right all over the place. Uh, so much so that when Lorenzo does die in 1492, the Medici Bank is almost bankrupt. Uh, many of the branches have closed. The money has largely run out. Um, so Lorenzo dies in 1492, and his son, Piero, becomes the next head of the Medici family and um, head of what's left of the Medici bank. Now, Piero will come to be known in history as Piero the Unfortunate. Um, we can probably figure out what happens to Piero just by that name. He is the unfortunate because he is one following Lorenzo the Magnificent, and that's tough to beat. And he comes into this position of power in Florence, but without the resources that his family had established, that his father had used so freely. So here you have Piero, now head of the Medici family, but without the money to continue the um, the wealth of the, the Medici family to continue the, the political means of the Medici family. Now, another reason why Piero is known as the unfortunate is because his reign is very short or his rule is very short. He's only the leader of Florence for about two years until 1494. In 1494, there is um, essentially a revolt against the Medici. And it's a revolt that is instituted and led by this man, Savonarola. Savonarola was a Dominican friar. 
Uh, he was one of the great preachers of his day. And he's actually invited into Florence during the lifetime of Lorenzo the Magnificent. Lorenzo invites him in because everybody has heard of Savonarola's passionate and fiery sermons. So Savonarola comes to Florence. He set up, I believe he was in Santa Maria Novella, which is the big church near the train station in Florence today. And there, from his pulpit, he is preaching to the people of Florence. Now, his preaching was very pointed. Uh, Savonarola preaches against vanity. He preaches against uh, riches. He is attacking, if not using their name, the Medici family themselves and the, the, uh, the grandeur and the opulence of the Medici and of Medici Florence. And he begins to gain a lot of followers. His, his speeches, his sermons are so passionate, so fiery, and so emotional that he starts to draw tens of thousands of people to hear him talk. Lorenzo the Magnificent himself goes to hear Savonarola talk. He hears the attacks on himself, on his family, but he doesn't really care because Lorenzo is pretty secure in his power. Well, when Lorenzo dies and Piero becomes the ruler of Florence, he doesn't have the political base. He doesn't have the foundation that Lorenzo had had. And Savonarola is preaching, uh, kind of riles up the Florentine people. They abandon Piero. He is forced to go into exile. The Medici are kicked out of the city. They go back to, to the countryside. And Savonarola establishes essentially a theocratic republic in the city of Florence. He is the one governing the city. And he his main goal is to eliminate what he sees as frivolity, what he sees as opulence. He sees all of those things as being symbols of sin and impurity. So Savonarola imposes what I guess we could call a Puritan type of rule over the city of Florence. He has tremendous influence over the government, even if he's not directly in charge. Now, what is an example of this? In uh, 1497, Savonarola preaches to the people of Florence that they must get rid of any symbols of ostentation, any symbols of frivolity, any symbols of, of vanity. And he calls for the people of Florence to gather up all of these things, makeup, fancy clothing, works of art, and to destroy them in a giant bonfire. And what we see occurring in February of 1497 is a bonfire of the vanities. As the people of Florence, under the sway of Savonarola, destroy all of these luxury items that they had. Now, one of the people who, who uh, follows Savonarola and becomes entranced by him is the artist Botticelli. You might know Botticelli for his famous Birth of Venus or his Primavera, the, the allegory of spring. Botticelli becomes so enamored of Savonarola's preaching that supposedly he takes some of his own paintings and throws them on the bonfire of the vanities, uh, destroying these precious works of art. So what we see is that in the immediate aftermath of the downfall of the Medici, the first downfall of the Medici, there's a little uh, preview, um, this theocratic regime is established in Florence, and much of that prosperity, much of that opulence that had been produced during the Medici reign is destroyed in events like this bonfire of the vanity. Well, what happens? Eventually, the people of Florence get kind of tired of Savonarola. They get tired of his preaching. They get tired of the austerity that he wants the city to have, and they, in turn, rebel against him. He is arrested and tried, and eventually he meets his own bonfire of the vanities. He is executed. He is burned at the stake in Piazza della Signoria, right there outside the Palazzo Vecchio. Uh, today, if you go here, there is a giant stone circle that marks the spot where Savonarola was burned at the stake. The death of Savonarola in 1498, so this is a year after that bonfire of the vanities, marks the a transitional period in Florentine history because the city of Florence decides to go back to its Republican roots. They begin to reestablish the old Florentine Republic as it had been prior to the rise of the Medici. Now, in this new Florentine Republic, there is a, a bureaucrat and a diplomat who uh, we will be very familiar with. He wasn't a large or an important player in contemporary politics in Florence, but he certainly left a long legacy. His name is Niccolo Machiavelli. How many of you have heard of Machiavelli? Why have you heard of Machiavelli? <laughs> uh, he, he was a uh, historian and a political theorist 
Uh, his most famous work is a book called The Prince, which was a guidebook to how to be a successful prince and how to rule over um, over people. Uh, it's kind of been a guidebook that has been used by politicians over the years. Uh, interestingly, his name was Niccolo. Uh, his infamy during his own lifetime and afterwards because of that book, The Prince, um, led to his name being synonymous with the name of the devil, a nickname for the devil, Old Nick. Old Nick is, some, is uh, sometimes, the devil is sometimes referred to as Old Nick because of Niccolo Machiavelli. So there's a little bit of trivia uh, you can have. In any case, Machiavelli is a bureaucrat during this period of the Florentine Republic where you have this resurgence of the idea of an independent Florence. It is during this period that the city of Florence hires a local, ar a local artist by the name of Michelangelo, Michelangelo, to create a sculpture that would symbolize the independence of Florence. He creates an eight foot tall statue of David made out of pure white Carrera marble. That statue of David is plunked at the entrance of the Palazzo Vecchio. Now why David? We saw the Medici creating a statue of David. We see Michelangelo creating a statue of David. The Florentines identified with David because if you think about the biblical story, David was a young shepherd who went to face the might of the, the giant Goliath. And the Florentines viewed themselves as a David in the uh, struggle of European politics, caught between the Goliaths of France and the Holy Roman Empire and the papacy and other powers. Florence was the little guy, yet Florence survived and Florence thro uh, thrived. So the people of Florence very much identified with that statue of David, and we see that created during this period of the Florentine Republic. Machiavelli himself was a bureaucrat, a diplomat. He goes on various missions. He is low-level kind of filing papers and copying documents and that sort of thing. But in 1512, there is turmoil in the Florentine Republic. There's turmoil because who comes knocking on the door again? But the Medici. The Medici start to make their way back into the city, and they begin to pull strings and man maneuver to reassert their former power over the city. And what we see in 1512 going into 1513 is a collapse of the Florentine Republic and a reestablishment of Medici power in the city. Now, when that occurs, people like Machiavelli are sent into exile. They are kicked out of the city. They were loyal to the Republic. They, they are gone. And Machiavelli will spend the rest of his life writing letters to the Medici asking to be let back into the city of Florence. The reason why he writes the book, The Prince, is because he was trying to get into the good favors of the Medici. He was saying, look, I can work for you too. I'm not just a Republican. I can give you this guidebook on politics. Uh, he never makes his way back into the city. The Medici keep him out. So Machiavelli is an important figure in this, um, this story. In any case, in 1513, the Medici reassert their power over the city of Florence. The person who does this, the, the person who gains control of the city, is Giuliano de' Medici, who we see here close to me. He was the youngest son of Lorenzo the Magnificent. Uh, he also had the title of the, the Duke of Nemours, which is a city in France. So Lorenzo, excuse me, Giuliano de' Medici does become the new ruler of Florence in 1513 when the Medici family come back. He only reigns over Florence or rules over Florence for three years. He dies in 1516, and he is succeeded by Lorenzo II, who's over there. It's called the Dirk, Duke of Urbino. He was the son of Piero the Unfortunate. Uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent's grandson. Now, how do the Medici manage to do this? How do they manage to make their way back into power in Florence? The Medici bank is gone. That source of their power is no longer there. But the Medici, under Lorenzo the Magnificent, had made, uh, had inserted their tentacles in various powerful places. And in fact, Lorenzo the Magnificent's second son was made a cardinal. And that cardinal becomes pope in 1513. He becomes Pope Leo X. Uh, his name was Giovanni de' Medici, Lorenzo's second son. So he was the younger brother of Piero the Unfortunate and the older brother of Giuliano, who comes to power there. Uh, so when uh, Giovanni, prior to becoming pope, is a cardinal, he is maneuvering 
in the church, within the structure of the church, to get the Medici back into Florence. And when he becomes Pope, he has unlimited power. He essentially helps his younger brother become the ruler of Florence. Um, Leo X, as Pope, basically his main concern was maintaining Medici power in Florence and in Tuscany. Uh, that was one of his goals. Now, because he was a Medici, he also commissioned numerous artists to paint and to sculpt and to create works of art. Uh, that is one of the outstanding traditions of the Medici family. They spent very heavily. They, they sponsored numerous artists. They are responsible for creating a lot of uh, art in the Western tradition. So Leo, using his position at Pope, as Pope maneuvers politically to get his family in charge of Florence and Tuscany, and he begins to spend money hiring artists to create all sorts of works of art. Um, one of the main concerns that Leo had was making sure Florence remained independent. This was a period in the 16th century where you had the rising power of Spain, the rising power of France, the Holy Roman Empire, each of them with ambitions on the Italian peninsula. So the Pope is maneuvering and playing parties off against one another, trying to maintain the family control. He is also in charge of the Western church when the Protestant Reformation begins. Uh, he kind of ignores that at first because he's more concerned with the Medici than with Martin Luther, but uh, that happens during his reign. So what do we see as a Medici Pope, the first of a series of Medici Popes using his papal authority to ensure the success of his family? He also commissions that artist Michelangelo to begin building a series of tombs in the uh, Medici Chapel. This was supposed to be a uh, grand final resting place for these Medici princes. Of the four tombs that were commissioned, only two were built, the two that we see here, designed and built by Michelangelo. Uh, they were the tombs of Giuliano, the Duke of Nemours, the, Lorenzo the Medici's uh, youngest son, and um, Lorenzo II, the successor to Giuliano. Those are the two tombs that were built. Giulia uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent's tomb is never completed. Cosimo's tomb is never completed, but these two are. So we see the Pope, Leo X, a Medici Pope, doing what Medici, the Medici do, spending money, creating works of art and ensuring their power. Now, uh, when Leo X dies, there is a brief period where you have a non-Medici Pope. But two years later, another Medici does achieve the papacy as Pope Clement VII. This is Giulio de Giuliano de' Medici. <laughs> Giulio de Giuliano de' Medici was the illegitimate son of Giuliano, the brother of Lorenzo the Magnificent. So you have Giuliano, the, the guy who liked to party a lot, liked to carouse. This was the result of some of that carousing. The nephew of Lorenzo the Magnificent now becomes Pope Clement VII. Um, his cousin had been the previous Pope, Leo X. So you have two Medici cousins now as Popes. The Medici are in a pretty good position now because they have the papacy and they have control over the city of Florence and of Tuscany. Um, Clement VII is involved in all sorts of European politics. All sorts of things are happening during his reign. The uh, Protestant Reformation is ramping up. Over in England, you have a king, Henry VIII, who wants to divorce his first wife. And Clement says, no, you can't do that. And that leads to all sorts of turmoil in England. Um, Protestantism does begin to spread during this time, but like his predecessor, Clement is mostly concerned with Medici power in Florence and Tuscany and creating lots of works of art. So um, he is a typical Medici prince coming from that lineage of spending money freely, building and creating works of art. Clement does manage to secure his family position in Tuscany and in Florence. He actually... Uh, dur it's during his reign that the Medici gain a noble title. To this point, they didn't really have a noble title in Tuscany or Florence. They were just the Medici. They ruled over the city, but didn't have that hereditary title. It is Clement's, uh, during Clement's reign that uh, Alessandro de' Medici is made the Duke of Florence. Now, who is Alessandro de' Medici? Um, he was publicly acknowledged to be the son of Lorenzo II, but in all likelihood, he was the illegitimate son of Giulio de Giuliano de' Medici. He was the illegitimate son of the Pope. Uh, so Clement gets his son, 
to be the Duke, uh, get the title, the Duke of Florence. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, the most powerful man in Europe at that time, helps in getting this, this done, helps in getting this title uh, achieved. Now, interestingly, uh, Alessandro de' Medici was sometimes called Il Moro, or the Moor, because he had a dark complexion. And it is believed that he may have been the first biracial ruler uh, in Europe, because it is thought that he was the product of a, a relationship between uh, Giulio de Giuliano de' Medici and an African servant in the Medici household. In any case, Alessandro does become the Duke of Florence. Um, now, he is made the head of the Florentine state. He is the guy now in charge of, of Florence and largely of Tuscany. Um, to solidify his position as the ruler of Florence and Tuscany, in um, 1536, Alessandro is married off to the daughter of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. Her name was Margaret of Austria. So we see a marriage between the Habsburgs and the Medici occurring here. So he, his position seems to be secure. The problem that we have with Alessandro is that like many of his predecessors, though he was married, he liked to go out cavorting. Uh, and he liked to to chase the pretty women of Florence and Tuscany. Um, apparently he had some sort of voracious appetite for that. And uh, uh, it often got him into interesting scrapes. Well, in um, 1537, that voracious appetite led to the demise of Alessandro de' Medici, the Duke of Florence. He was um, basically murdered uh, by some people he thought were his friends. It was a, a, a political assassination of sorts. The way it unfolded is that there had been this lovely young lady that Alessandro had been pursuing and she had been resisting him. Uh, one day he gets a message saying, oh, I'll meet you in this, this room in a part of the city of Florence. So he shows up by himself without his bodyguards. Uh, he's brought into the dark room where assassins are waiting for him and they stab him to death. And then they lock the door and shut the windows and uh, leave him in that room. His body, his dead body is in that room. Now, in other parts of Florence, there is great concern because nobody knows where the Duke is. He hasn't been seen for days. There's a mystery, a mystery that isn't solved until the stench of decaying flesh starts coming out of that room and they kick open the door and who do they find there? But Alessandro. Now, this could have been a problem for the Medici dynasty because Alessandro did not have any children, at least that we know of. He did not have any children. He was the sole descendant, the sole remaining descendant of Cosimo de' Medici, Pater Patria. This was the end of that senior line of the Medici family. What happens when you have a nobleman who dies who does not have an heir? Well, he's married, but he doesn't have any children. It actually jumps to his cousins, that junior line, the younger brother of Cosimo. That is where that second part of the Medici family comes in. So when Alessandro dies, the title of Duke of Florence goes to his cousin, Cosimo. They all have the same names. I don't know if you've caught on to that yet. Cosimo was the great, great grandson of Lorenzo, the brother of Cosimo de' Medici. So he was distant cousin. Cosimo I inherits the title of Duke of Florence, a title he will hold uh, until... 1569. In 1569, his title is upgraded to the Grand Duke of Tuscany. What we see under Cosimo is the establishment of the Medici Grand Duchy, the Grand Duchy of Tuscany. The Medici are now not just the, uh, the titular heads of Florence. They now have a title for the entire region of Tuscany there in central Italy. Cosimo um, was very typical of a 16th century uh, ruler, a 16th century nobleman. He, being a Medici, uh, hired lots of artists to create many works of art, many paintings, lots of paintings and sculptures of him. Uh, we see a portrait of Cosimo there. We see a bust of him there uh, wearing the armor of Hercules, the classical Greek god. Here he is on horseback. There are statues of Cosimo I all over Florence and all over Tuscany. Um, he was, after all, a Medici. What we see is that Cosimo's reign does bring stability to Florence. It does establish the Medici as the grand ducal dynasty in Tuscany itself. Cosimo, of course, gets married. And he marries somebody from a, suitable, a suitably noble family. He marries a Spanish princess 
Um, her name is Eleanor of Toledo, who we see over there. Uh, Eleanor of Toledo was a very astute businesswoman, I guess we could say. She was very good at managing money and very good at business transactions. And one of the most important business transactions that she makes is purchasing an old palace on the other side of the Arno River in Florence, the Pitti Palace. She buys that and that becomes the seat of power for the Medici. So they abandon the old Palazzo Medici over near the Duomo and they move into this new, larger, much more opulent palace on the other side of the Arno River. Uh, this is the Palazzo Pitti over here. Um, and that becomes the seat of Medici power. That becomes where they start to keep all of their art. And in fact, if you visit the Palazzo Pitti, you are walking through the Medici's private art gallery. Uh, and it is covered floor to ceiling with art. Uh, magnificent works of art all over the place, everywhere you look in the Palazzo Pitti. That is because Eleanor of Toledo was smart enough to buy that palace. Uh, the Pitti family had gone bankrupt. She sw uh, swooped in, purchased that, and that becomes where the, the Medici um, base their power. Now, another important um, physical development that takes place in Florence during this period, during the reign of Cosimo I, is that to get from the Pitti Palace on one side of the river over to the Signoria, which is where the, the business of government was taking place, you had to walk. You had to walk across the Ponte Vecchio. You had to walk amongst the crowds that were there. And Cosimo didn't necessarily want to be there with the common people. So he hires the architect and artist Vasari to build a corridor that goes above the, um, the Ponte Vecchio, the shops on the Ponte Vecchio, connecting the Pitti with the Uffizi, the old offices of the Medici, and the Palazzo della Signoria. So you have this walkway, a covered walkway, a sheltered walkway that Cosimo and the Grand Dukes of Tuscany would get would use to get from their palace to their place of business so that they didn't have to mingle with the common people down below. Um, I guess the privilege of wealth and power. Um, now, while Cosimo is establishing himself as the Grand Duke of Tuscany and securing his positions and moving into the Palazzo Pitti, there are still members of that senior branch of the family that are around, but they were women, so they couldn't inherit any titles. One of those women, um, the daughter of Lorenzo II, was named Catherine, Catherine de Medici, and she is married off to a French prince, uh, a French prince named Henry the Duke of Orléans. Henry eventually becomes the King of France as King Henry II, making Catherine de' Medici the Queen Consort of France. Now, Henry and Catherine had a very rocky relationship. They didn't really get along. They didn't really like each other. Well, she was hopelessly devoted to him. He liked to spend time with his mistress, Diana of Poitiers. But despite that rocky relationship, uh, they did end up producing 10 kids. Um, now... Of those 10 kids, uh, well, I'll get to the 10 kids in a minute. So this marriage is arranged. You have the French prince marrying the Medici princess. It is arranged by the Pope, Clement VII, Giulio de Giuliano de Medici. So he's looking out for his family interest, getting his cousin to marry a French prince, the French prince who eventually come, becomes the king of France. Now, they do have a lot of kids, Catherine and Henry, including three sons that will become kings of France. Uh, Henry, excuse me, Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III. All are children of Henry II and Catherine de' Medici. One of their daughters will marry Philip II, King of Spain. She becomes Queen Consort of Spain. Another daughter, whose name was Marguerite, will marry the king of a small, uh, small state called Navarre. That king's name is Henry. So you have Marguerite marrying Henry of Navarre. Now, why is that important? Henry of Navarre will eventually become king of France as Henry IV. Uh, when Henry III dies, he doesn't have any children. Henry of Navarre is the next closest relative. He becomes the king of France, Henry IV. Uh, Marguerite of Valois, the daughter of Catherine de Medici, becomes queen of France. Just wait, though, it gets even more complicated. In any case, what we see is the Medici have now made their way into the French royal family and Members of the French royal family are descendants, are intermarried with the Medici. This is great for the Medici. It's not bad for the French royal family. Um, 
the French do manage to kind of steal a bunch of artists from Italy and move them to France. So the center of the Renaissance does move to France by this point. But um, Catherine de' Medici uh, is an important player in French society. It's also said that Catherine de' Medici may have introduced the fork into French society. Uh, the French were eating with their hands. Catherine comes along, having been raised with the Medici and all this wealth and this, this refinement and uses a fork, um, which was shocking. In any case, what we have is now an intermarriage between Medici Tuscany and um, Valois France. Meanwhile, back in Tuscany, Cosimo I does eventually die. He's succeeded by his eldest son, Francesco, who becomes Grand Duke of Tuscany in 1567. Francesco I was not a good ruler. He was regarded as a tyrant. He was, um, he was cruel. He was... Uh, he spent money freely. In fact, he nearly bankrupts Tuscany. He was a Medici, however, so he does spend a lot of money uh, supporting artists and scientific inquiry and that sort of stuff. But he is not really a good ruler. He nearly destroys the Grand Duchy. He is succeeded by his brother, Ferdinando, who we see over here in the middle. Ferdinando had been a cardinal. He had been sent off to the church. That's what happens to younger sons. But when he becomes the Grand Duke of Tuscany, he has to leave the church and he has to get married because what is a grand duke supposed to do? Produce children. So he has to get married to continue the family line. Ferdinando was a much more, um, he was a better ruler than his older brother had been. Ferdinando actually had a better education. He was um, uh, very much a patron of the arts. He managed to get finances and taxation under control. We see stability occurring in the Grand Duchy because of Ferdinando I. Uh, he, a much wiser ruler than his brother, sometimes considered the pinnacle of the Archduchy of Tuscany. And then uh, in 1609, when Ferdinando dies, he is succeeded by his son, Cosimo. Cosimo II. Cosimo II actually supported the works of guys like Galileo. Uh, so he was tied with Galileo in that type of scientific inquiry. Uh, he appoints Galileo as a professor of mathematics at the University of Pisa. Uh, famously, Galileo goes and drops some balls off of the Leaning Tower to see how fast they fall, that sort of thing. Uh, Cosimo also used diplomacy as a tool for maintaining his position for increasing security and peace on the Italian peninsula. Uh, we have to remember that throughout the Middle Ages, Italy was chaotic, um, kind of like it is today in a lot of ways. You had all these different states vying for power, vying for control. We have a brief period of stability in Italy during this period of Cosimo II's reign, because he was a skilled diplomat, he was able to pull some strings and create alliances that, for a brief period, stabilized and secured the Italian peninsula and economics on the Italian peninsula. Now, while all of this is going on, you have this succession of Grand Dukes in Tuscany, you have a couple of more Medici popes. Um, these Medici popes aren't as important as the previous two. One, Pius VI, was actually from a, a, a distant branch of the family that was based in Milan in northern Italy. They were cousins of the, the uh, Tuscan uh, Florence Medici, but they weren't quite the same. The Tuscan Medici, the Florence Medici, do embrace uh, Pius because he was a Medici, but he's not really politically significant. The other pope... Uh, Leo XI over here only reigns for about three weeks. Uh, so he's not really important at all. But what we do see is the Medici still have influence. They still have power. They are still involved in, uh, in church politics and in positions of power in the church. Now, while all of this is going on, we go back to France. And Marie de' Medici. Marie de' Medici was the daughter of Francesco I, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. In 1600, she marries Henry IV. Now, wait a second. Wasn't Henry IV already married no. to Marguerite of Valois, the daughter of Catherine de' Medici? Yes, he was. But <laughs> Marguerite and Henry despised each other. So their marriage is very rocky. They don't produce any children, and they do, have a they do get divorced. And as soon as Henry IV is divorced from Marguerite of Valois, he goes and marries Marie de' Medici. Um, and she within a year, gives birth to a son named Louis, who will become Louis XIII, King of France. Um, uh, one of their daughters, Elizabeth, later becomes Queen of Spain as the wife of Philip IV. And another daughter, Henrietta Maria, becomes Queen of England 
as the wife of Charles I. So again, the Medici spreading out into various royal families across Europe, uh, marrying twice into the French royal family. Now, Marie de Medici is sort of a tragic figure because she actually is never crowned queen of France. She is the queen consort. Um, her husband is assassinated in 1610. Henry IV is assassinated. And when he dies, their infant son or their young son, Louis XIII, becomes king. And for a while, Marie de Medici is the regent of France. She has the power in France until Louis XIII comes of age. Um, now, interestingly, who is Marie de Medici's grandson? Another Louis? Louis XIV. Perhaps the most powerful king in uh, recent French history. So we see the Medici again tied into all of these families. Now, while this is going on in France, what's happening in Tuscany? We have some more Grand Dukes. Um, <laughs> Ferdinando II uh, becomes Grand Duke in 1621, reigns until 1670. He is succeeded by his son, Cosimo III, who reigns for 53 years. The most notable thing about these two Grand Dukes is how long they reigned. You have two Grand Dukes ruling for more than a century. Uh, they weren't really distinguished other than being Grand Dukes of Tuscany. Tuscany itself is going into an economic decline during this time period. It's no longer a cultural epicenter in Europe. It's no longer an economic epicenter in Europe. You have a Grand Duchy. The Medici control Tuscany, but these two guys really not significant. The most distinguishing thing is the length of their reigns. When Cosimo III dies in 1723, he is succeeded by his son, John Gaston. Yeah, just wait until you hear about John Gaston. Uh, John Gaston would be the last Medici to rule over Tuscany. Uh, John Gaston is a somewhat tragic figure, a somewhat uh, horrific figure. He, um, as the Grand Duke of Tuscany, had to find a suitable wife so that he could continue the family line. A German princess is brought to Tuscany and they are married, but the two hate each other. They despise each other. Their marriage is probably never consummated. Part of the problem, part of the reason for that is because John Gaston um, preferred to spend time with his, his young men at court um, rather than with his wife. Uh, his wife gets so disgusted with him that she actually packs up and goes back to Germany. Now, that's understandable when we consider that John Gaston um, rarely left his bedroom at the Pitti Palace, never, uh, toward the end of his life, never left his bed, never washed his hair or cut his hair, never cut his fingernails or toenails. Uh, basically spent his, the last years of his life, the last year of his, of his reign, wallowing in his own um, filth in one of the bedchambers of the Palazzo Pitti. When he dies in 1737, he is the last of the Medici the last male Medici, the Grand Ducal line ends with John Gaston de Medici. He is the last Grand Duke of Tuscany. Now, I say he was the last Grand Duke of Tuscany, but he was not the last Medici because he had a sister. His sister, Anna Maria Luisa de Medici, had gone out and might have been married off to the uh, Elector of Palatine, which was one of the German principalities, an important German prince. Uh, her husband had died, so she became the Dowager Electress of Palatine. When her brother, John Gaston, died in 1737, it's Anna, Anna Maria Luisa who inherited all of the Medici property. She couldn't inherit the title, but she inherited everything else, which was the Palazzo Pitti, all the artwork in it, all the artwork in the Uffizi, uh, numerous palaces across Florence. And what does Anna Maria Luisa do? In her will, when she dies, she gives all of that Medici property, all of that Medici art to the people of Tuscany. So when you go to Florence today and you walk through the Pitti Palace, and you walk through the Uffizi, what you're actually seeing is the donation, the last will of Anna Maria Luisa de' Medici. That collection of art that had been acquired over uh, 350 years of Medici patronage stays where it was because she made sure that it remained with the people of Florence and the people of Tuscany. So when you go there and you see the artwork, you experience Florence as it is, much of what you were experiencing was done by the Medici and remains there because of that last Medici, Anna Maria Luisa. And that 
is the story of the rise and fall and rise and fall of the Medici dynasty. <laughs> I'm gonna take a sip of my cold coffee. Does anybody have any questions? How do you remember it all? <laughs> I make it up, you know. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yes. I think part of it, I, I don't know if there are actually, I'm sure there are some primary sources somewhere in, in an archive in Italy, but I think part of what, um, what turned the mind of the king in Naples was the fact that Lorenzo was brave enough to go by himself to the court in, in, um, in Naples. Now, Lorenzo had done so, this sort of stuff before. He had used his own person for personal diplomacy. Rather than sending an ambassador, he would go and meet and negotiate with people. So it was certainly part of his character. But that kind of bravery, that kind of uh, audaciousness, you know, the king in Naples was considered one of the most, most ruthless and bloodthirsty rulers in Europe at that time. And here you have this, this uh, bold Florentine prince who comes and looks you in the eye and makes this arrangement. So it certainly must have been something that impressed the King of Naples. There are many other families. Um, the Sforza family does it, the, uh, the Montefeltro family, certainly the, um, um, there's another family, in the Visconti in, in uh, in Milan. So what we see happening during the Renaissance is that families begin to hire artists because hiring those artists um, glorified yourself in a way. And we see that happening a lot. The Medici were certainly in the forefront of that. Hiring, commissioning artists to create works of art, to put statues in their villas, to put statue paintings on their walls. That celebrated them. It celebrated their position and their wealth. Other families, other noble families throughout Europe start to do the same thing. So we see that all over Italy, particularly northern Italy. Lots of um, wealthy dukes and princes in northern Italy commission artists. Um, if you look at one of, my, one of uh, Leonardo's most famous paintings, uh, or a lot of Leonardo's works, in fact, were commissioned by the rulers, the dukes of Milan. Um, Leonardo was from the vicinity. He was from Tuscany. He was from near Florence. He uh, lived with the Medici for a short time and then is, kind of has to go and find, make his fortune somewhere else. He ends up in Milan. The, the Milanese rulers were wealthy and ambitious, so they are hiring Leonardo to create instruments of war. If you look at Leonardo's notebooks, he's got drawings for all sorts of things in there for creating works of art um, because Leonardo was a name and they wanted to associate themselves with that name. So it was a way of uh, noble families of celebrating themselves by hiring these artists. So we certainly see that throughout Italy. It's, it's one of the driving factors of the Renaissance, in fact. So, so do the do the works the, the works that the Medici commissioned by and large are in Florence but there are works by artists that were had worked for the Medici that are certainly in other places the Mona Lisa is the prime example of that right the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci was begun in Florence during the period of Medici rule. It wasn't commissioned by the Medici, but Leonardo gets invited by the King of France, Francis I, to go there to work in the French court, and he takes this unfinished painting of a, a woman with him. Uh, he takes him a long time to finish that painting, but it never leaves France. Um, so you do see that. I mean, the artists themselves moved around a lot, so their artwork would be in different places. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I'm just curious when you talk about the relationship between the Florentine community and other princes in the 1500s. Oh, sir. I mean, depending on what period of history you're looking at, for a long time, Florence and Pisa were rivals. Florence and Siena were rivals, going back to like the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. Florence eventually emerges as the, the regional power, um, and Pisa, Siena, Lucca all become kind of. Um, vassal states, if you will, of Florence. And once the Grand Duchy is established, it is 
all part of the Grand Duchy of Tuscany. Yep. Yes. Eleanor of Toledo, yeah. Spain, by this period, had emerged as the most powerful kingdom in, in the world, really. Uh, we have to remember 1492, Lorenzo de' Medici dies in Florence. A few months later, Christopher Columbus sails across the ocean and establishes the beginning of the Spanish Empire in the New World. Over the course of the 16th century, Spain, exploiting their New World possessions, creates a massive empire. And during the reign of Charles V and his son, uh, Philip II, Spain is the most powerful state in Europe. The Spanish kings have a global empire that includes most of the Americas, uh, stretches as far as the Philippines with outposts along the African coast. So Spain becomes hugely, hugely powerful. The problem that emerges in Spain is that the Habsburgs, the Spanish Habsburgs, um, stop marrying outside of the family. Uh, and what we see over the course of the 16th century uh, and the 17th century is that Habsburgs are marrying Habsburgs. And the family tree of the Spanish Habsburgs becomes very much intertwined. So much so that by the early 18th century, the last Spanish Habsburg, um, I think it was Charles X, I can't remember what number it was, um, is born with all sorts of physical defects. He is uh, impotent, he is sterile. He is unable to swallow his food. He has this extra extended jaw, a swollen tongue. He can't talk. And when he dies, the Habsburg dynasty in Spain dies. So um, the Spanish Habsburgs weren't really marrying outside the family very much. <laughs> yes, one more question. Poison was certainly a, a tool that was used. Now, you're probably thinking of the Borgias, who are another prominent family of that time. Lucretia Borgia was uh, certainly known to um, poison. The Borgias themselves were tremendously politically ambitious. They were actually a Spanish family that end up uh, as uh, some of the Borgias end up as popes and cardinals, and they're involved in a lot of the Italian politics. And uh, Lucretia does marry a couple of Italian noblemen and uh, a lot of people do meet suspicious ends. Uh, poison, you have to consider that poison was a, a tool that women had accessible to them to change their situation. Whereas men could draw a sword and kill somebody, women were not supposed to do that, but a little bit of poison in somebody's tea or in their cup of wine, and suddenly you're a widow, right? So you have that kind of situation. All right, well, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed that, and I will see you next time.